So thank you uh, very much for the invitation to uh, speak here. Um, uh, so uh, I, like, as, as, as you said, I'm gonna be talking about sphere packings in hyperbolic space. Uh, so this is joint work with Spencer Bachman, uh, Anton Halato, who's a graduate student here at UVM and Veronica Potter, she's an undergraduate here at, uh, at UVM. Uh, here's the outline of the talk. It, it comes in three parts. The first part is I'm going to review some of the classical material. So I'm going, to, I'm going to review the classical story um, uh, about the upper half plane in, in the complex numbers and uh, in PSL2z and its relation to Ford circles and Fourier fractions. And then I'm going to give some ideas about general, generalizing. So one of the things that I wanted to do is kind of move this to quaternions and beyond. And then, um, and then I'm going to talk about, about how to do this in all dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to start with the classical story and, and um, uh, it's about uh, the Mobius transformations in the, uh, the uh, upper half plane in the complex numbers. So as usual, uh, H2 is going to denote the, the uh, upper half plane of the complex numbers. So these are number, numbers with positive imaginary part. Um, for part of this talk, uh, I'll refer to the boundary as the real line. Um, and, uh, and often I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to only consider rational numbers on the boundary. Uh, and this is because I'm going to be looking at uh, orbits under integer fractional linear transformations, which makes it, in, in, in so, so since uh, those are in the orbit of infinity, we'll, we'll consider Q. And, um, and, and also I'll be, we'll be looking at the, the Riemann sphere, which is essentially the complex numbers union infinity, all right? Um, and so I just want to remind you that the automorphisms of, of, the, the, of, of the Riemann sphere is, is PSL2C. So these, this group is in bijection with uh, Mobius transformations um, and uh, with, with complex coefficients. So I'm just going to conflate the matrix group and Mobius transformations throughout the talk. OK, uh, I also want to remind you that the upper half plane has PSL2R uh, as, as automorphism. Um, and uh, so this, these are Mobius transformations with, with real coefficients. Uh, inside of this group, there's PSL2Z. So these are Mobius transformations with integer coefficients. And I just want to remind you that there's, there's two generators of this group. Um, there's one, which is S, which is an involution, uh, or, or which is, a, sorry, a, um, inversion with, with a sign, and then T, which is just translation by one. I guess I should also remind you that um, so that Mobius transformations, every Mobius transformation can be written is a composition of three types of, of operation. One is just scaling by a complex number. One is translating by a complex number and the other is inversion. And inversion is kind of like the key to the, the story uh, uh, in all of this. Um, so that's kind of the weird operation. And one of the, the cool parts about it is that uh, uh, inversion preserves circle, takes circles to circles. And so uh, in general, there's a whole subject called inversive geometry devoted to you know, taking spheres uh, in higher dimensions and, and, and looking at, a, at inverting uh, geometrically in, in spheres. And, and that operation also preserves circles, uh, sends higher dimensional spheres to higher dimensional spheres. Um, okay, and the, the last little comment on the bottom left there is what I was saying about um, the boundary of, of, of uh, of the of hyperbola H2 and uh, taking it to be the rational numbers, na namely because we, we're gonna have the, or we're gonna have to consider the orbit of infinity. All right, so that's the basic setup. Um, here is what I mean by circles going to circles, right? So uh, here's a picture of a Mobius transformation and you can see, oh, uh, one of the things that I for forgot to say was that when I say circle, I include circles of infinite radius. So straight lines, I'm going to consider as circles of infinite radius. And if you include those, then inversion of, a, of any circle goes to a circle. And so you can see uh, as in this, this, this picture here. And so this is a Mobius transformation where u is um, e to the i theta. So it's just like a unit complex number. Um, all right, and, and uh, okay. And so in higher dimensions, we'll, we'll consider infinite, so for example, we'll consider an infinite plane in H3 to be, um, to be an, a, a, a two sphere of infinite radius and so on, okay? So um, that's, uh, that's the basics of Mobius transformations. So I was first introduced to 
forward circles and fairy fractions uh, through this book by the late John Conway uh, called The Sensual Quadratic Form. So this is a, a great book um, about quadratic forms and, um, and, and, and uh, eta functions and all sorts of interesting mathematics come into, you know, come up in, in this book. And it's very short. So if you haven't seen this book, it's, it's amazing. And so there's a, a very small, short introduction to this topic in the first part of this book. Um, and I'm just, and, and it's, it's, it's so short, it's, I can just actually post all of it here. It's, it's seven pages in total. And, um, and it, it, it kind of lays out the uh, relationship between forward circles and fairy fractions and, uh, and PSL2Z. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna, let's go into this. So what we're after here is a certain arrangement of, of circles in the complex upper half plane uh, where they're tangent to exactly one point on the boundary of the, the half plane at a rational number. So this is what they look like. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use right the, the geometry of the upper half plane and the, the, you know, the fundamental domain structure to uh, inscribe uh, circles in, in what, what he calls fans, right? So I, I'm going to say a little bit more about this, but um, uh, so this is what we're after, this, this packing here, right? And you can see that that vertical line, or sorry, the horizontal line at the top is one of those circles at infinite radius. The bottom line does not count, right? So that's not one of our, our circles, that's the boundary. All right. So there's two ways of defining this configuration of circles, right? I could either just kind of give you a direct definition of what the set of circles is, or I can describe it indirectly as an orbit of one of the circles, right? So I can just take, I can take all these Mobius transformations and, and just act on one particular circle and, and get them all, or I can just give you the definition directly. And, and they're both good for, for various reasons. Um, and in, but in, in the higher dimensional case, uh, things will be different. So things get more complicated. And, and, um, and I just wanted to point this out that they're, they're not obviously equivalent in, in um, the same. And so why am I calling these things normal spheres? Because in the higher dimensional case, the radiuses are defined in terms of norms of prime ideals or the reduced norm of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, these things called Clifford algebras. And so um, that's why they got the name normal. Okay, so I'm gonna describe this first presentation. Again, we're, we're working in the upper half plane. Okay, and so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna start with a, a circle or two circles even, okay, and um, uh, I guess I could take this one to the other one via inversion, but what we're going to do is we're just going to start acting by the group, right? PSL2Z, right? So there's these S's and T's, right? And, um, and so one thing you can notice is that, uh, you know, if I, so C infinity, if you want to know, like there, there are stabilizers. So C infinity, uh, every, it, there, there's a whole, every translate, right? Stabilizes that top that top, uh, that circle of infinite radius. So um, they all have stabilizers that are isomorphic to Z. Um, uh, okay, so how do we produce all these circles? Okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this cir the, the circle, okay, that's, so this, this initial circle, C0 over one, is a circle that's tangent to um, uh, zero uh, on the boundary and has radius one half, okay? And uh, what you can do is you can shift it along. And then if you shift it just outside one, right? So minus one or one, and then you invert it, what's gonna happen is it's gonna shrink the circle to a smaller, one of those smaller circles, okay? And then you can shift that again far out. And then if you invert that, that gives you, produces an even smaller circle, right? And so by continuing this process, you can end up getting all, uh, all, all the circles of all these different radiuses that, that, that I, I described, okay? So, um, all right, so that's, that's how this works. What, again, uh, I should say that under any one of these transformations, once you have two things that are tangent, they're gonna remain tangent, right? So um, uh, this is what's convenient about this PSL2, uh, this, this, this definition where we take it as an orbit, 
okay? Because it, the packing property is much clearer. So um, the other way we could have defined the, 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 the packing, right? Or the, the, the collection of spheres, right? Uh, is what I was calling normal spheres. And so I'm just gonna give a completely direct definition. So at each circle or at, at each rational number, I, which is in reduced form, I'm gonna define a circle that's gonna be tangent to this, the, this point. And then it's gonna have radius one over two, the denominator squared, okay? And, um, and so they're like this, that, that, that's, this is what they look like. And if you just take all the rational numbers and you put all these circles down, this, is, this will give you the packing, okay? But from this definition, it's not so clear. The interesting part about, uh, you know, uh, one interesting part about these, these, uh, these, uh, these circles is that, well, for each neighbor, they're going to have a, a mutual neighbor, and that mutual neighbor is given by um, the, the median of those two rational numbers, okay? So to find the one that is adjacent to both of them, the common, common neighbor, what you can do is you can take a median of, of, of the, the two numbers. Um, what else do I want to say? So another thing that, that you should know is that um, these forward circles are completely determined by their adjacency, right? W what point they hit on the, um, uh, on the real line, okay? So um, once we know that point, uh, this, 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 uh, this, the circle will be fixed. This is because that we know from, let's say from the first definition, we know that they're, they're, um, uh, they, they can't overlap, right? So you can't have two, two uh, circles that are gonna be tangent to the same point, okay? Um, okay, th this is what I was saying is that the tangency is given by this median formula. Okay, so now I want to uh, stop for a second and describe this, um, this connection to fairy fractions and remind you guys what fairy fractions are, or maybe you've never seen a fairy fraction before. So what's a fairy fraction? So what I'm gonna do is you hand me an integer, right? And then I'm gonna look at all the integers in between zero and one with the denominator at most that integer. Okay, so if I hand you, if you hand me four, so I'm gonna write all the numbers with, with denominator at most four in between zero and one. And then I'm gonna order them according to their size. So in this case, you get zero, one fourth, one third, one half, two thirds, three fourths, and then one, okay? So those, that, that, those are the fairy fractions of level four, okay? So, uh, so uh, okay, so now I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write out some more fairy fractions. Okay, so these are the fairy fractions of level three, and then these are the fairy fractions of level two, okay? And I want to, do, uh, so, so I told you about medians of Ford circles, right? Uh, and I want to tell you now about medians, or, sorry, uh, sorry the, the adjacencies of, of, of uh, sorry, of uh, what I call normal, normal circles, or it's, it's, it's four circles and, spoiler, four circles and uh, 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 normal circles are the same, right, in this, in this situation. But, okay, so here are the, the ver fairy fractions of various levels, okay? And one thing that I want to point out is how one level is related to the other levels, okay? So if I take two adjacent fairy fractions, okay, of some level, and I take their median, right, what's going to happen is that they're going to insert, right, that median is going to be uh, some new fairy fraction on a different level, like some, a new adjacency that's going to be between those two points. Uh, I should point out that it's not always the level below, so, for example, if you were going to take one third and two thirds and do this median construction, right, then you would get two over five, right? And so that would be a fairy fraction of level five, which is, which is two below, right? So it's not like you always take the median and it just goes one level down, right? But it does have the property that uh, the median is going to be uh, adjacent in some other level. All right. So what do fairy fractions have to do with Ford circles? Okay, so I have all these, these, uh, these circles, okay? That, that, I, that come from this packing. And what you can do with all these circles is if I limit the, the uh, radius that, that, that I consider, so I say, okay, 
I'm only going to look at four. So I'm going to stick a horizontal line in, and I'm and I'm going to throw away all the circles that are completely below the line. Okay. If I do that, then you're and I, and I say I look at the circle the the ones that are uh, the 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 rational the ones the rational numbers that are tangent to the leftover circles in the interval zero to one. I will get a fairy sequence, right? So, so, it, so they appear. So all of these things that are, if you truncate it, they appear in fairy sequences, right? So the 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 way that these 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 circles are tangent, okay? So that's that's kind of the connection between uh, uh, forward circles and in fairy circles. And let me kind of describe to you why this is true, okay? So what wh why? Okay, so we have this thing that's this orbit under PSL two Z. I had this fairy fraction thing, and uh, I told you that these two things are connected, right? Uh, and I'm now going to kind of describe why they're connected. Okay, so the key idea that connects these two things is that there's, say, if you look in the the number theory book Hardy and Wright, they'll have a section on on fairy fractions, and there is a condition for when two uh, rational numbers are adjacent fairy fractions. If you have two rational numbers and I order them. It turns out that these will be adjacent as fairy fractions for some level n, if and only if uh, the following condition holds, right? So it's that RQ minus PS is equal to one, right? And this looks very much like a determinant condition, right? And in fact, if I were gonna take adjacent fairy fractions and stick them into a matrix, I, I, I do get something that's an SL2R because, because of this, this condition precisely. Okay, okay. As I said, I'm going to be conflating um, matrices and Mobius transformations a little bit. But if I take this matrix and then I make the Mobius transformation associated to this matrix, I want you to observe uh, two things, right? The first thing that I want you to observe is that when I plug in zero, right? So that it looks like R times Z plus P over S times Z plus Q. Okay, if I plug in zero, the R and the S get killed and I just get P over Q. Okay, so f of zero is p over q. If I plug in infinity, right, well, the, that other part goes away and I just get r over s, okay? So, uh, okay, you can read off a relationship between uh, the, the matrix and, and where infinity and, and zero are sent. All right, that's one thing. Um, all right, so why do I, why am I talking about this? Well, okay, so, so let's look at an initial cluster of, of circles. So. Here I've chosen three circles that are mutually tangent, right? I've taken the circle, this, this circle of infinite radius, the circle of radius, uh, uh, sorry, the circle of radius one half tangent at zero, and then it's translate by one, okay? So th these three circles are all mutually tangent. And if I were gonna apply any Mobius transformation in the world, right, um, they would remain tangent, right? Okay, but if I were to happen to, to take uh, something in PSL2Z of this form, well, what ends up happening is that, as I said, the circles are completely determined by where they're tangent to the boundary, okay? So I know that this infinite circle from that previous computation, computation will have to go to R over S. And then, you know, uh, then I have uh, the, 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 the green circle will have to go to P over Q because F of zero ended up being P over Q, okay? And the third circle, right, has to be one that's mutually tangent to the other ones, right? Uh, but that's gonna be where we plug in one, right? And if we plug in one, you'll see that this is the median, right, of the other two things. Okay, so there's kind of, um, uh, Okay, so there's there's kind of something going on here. And so what I wanna say is that, okay, any Mobius transformation with, um, uh, with that starts with R and S in the matrix in the, in the first column, right? That'll have to send the infinite circle to the circle at, 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 that's, that's at R over S, okay? There's many ways to complete this matrix, okay? But there's also many other circles that are tangent to the circle at infinity, okay? And this, this choice of circle at infinity, the, the other tangency, 
is equivalent to choosing a way of completing this matrix, right? So there's kind of a correspondence between the geometry of, of the way these circles are arranged and how you can you know, fix a column and how you can complete the, that column of a matrix to be an element of PSL2Z, okay? So, um, okay, and, and the other thing that I wanted to say is that, that uh, this explains the median property in terms of, um, uh, in terms of this, the, the, the tangencies of the circles, all right. So this is where, th where this comes from. Okay, so there, again, just to kind of summarize, there was two ways to define the packings. There was this forward packing, which was the orbit of this circle at zero, okay? And then there was the normal spheres, which was defined in terms of a point of tangency in the radius. And that we had a theorem that, that says that these, these two things are the same, okay? So in, in the classical situation, these two are the same. And um, moreover, um, we have a description of when two circles are tangent by a Fairy fraction property. We characterized Fairy fractions in terms of this kind of determinant condition, right? And, um, uh, and you know, it relates to the, you know, the way that SL2Z is defined in, 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 in that third point, okay? So we have kind of, okay, so we have two descriptions of this collection of spheres and some description of explicit description of the arithmetic of the tangency. All right. All right, that's that's good. All right, so um, I, th okay, when I originally planned this talk, I thought it would come back to this later, but I think we're not gonna have enough time. So, um, sorry. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take a little side here to do something fun. Okay, so, uh, appl okay, application. Uh, so there's a there's a famous theorem in number theory called uh, uh, Louisville's theorem, and uh, it, it's about approx approximation of um, irrational numbers by rational numbers. So Louisville's theorem says that I can approximate any irrational number, real irrational number, by a rational number, and I can do it pretty well. So it gives you a good estimate. So on um, uh, on the the uh, approximation, okay? And let me describe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a proof of Louisville's theorem from just using uh, the, this, th this packing that I described, okay? So this is uh, an awesome, uh, a pretty cool proof. Okay, so here's my packing, okay? If I have an irrational number, okay? So it's, a, it's real, but it's not rational, right? I know that, this line that I pierce through these things is going to have to hit infinitely many of these circles. Okay, so this this line here pierces an infinite number of the circles. Okay, so what does that mean? So if it pierces infinitely many of the circles, that means that this alpha is going to be next to um, is going to be within the point of tangency, right? Uh, up to, uh, so it's going to be within the radius of the point of tangency. So like if you were to smoosh, every, if, if you were going to take one of these pierced circles and smoosh everything down, right, you'd get an interval. And in this interval, right, you would find your alpha, you'd find the center, and then the, the, um, the, the outside of the interval would be, you know, outside of alpha, okay? And if we just write this, what, what this means, in numbers, we get Dirichlet's theorem, right? So we knew what the radius of the circle was. So at, at each of those PIs over QIs, right? right? So the, the, the radius of the circle was one over two QI squared. I can give you a proof of why. Um, wh why. So I, I, I give you a definition and I gave you this normal spheres thing. I didn't really tell you that the radius of these circle, I didn't really prove that the radius of the forward packing circles is um, one over two Q squared, right? I, that's something I just told you. That comes from a formula in inversive geometry. So if you, if you have, you know, if I, if I have a, a circle and I invert it in, an, invert it in another circle, there's uh, formulas for what the new center of that circle is gonna be and what the radius of that circle is, is gonna be. And it really has nothing to do with complex analysis or or the complex numbers, it's a, it's, a, it's a theorem in pure geometry, okay? 
Um, anyway, this, I, I think this is a, a really cool proof of that you can you can you can prove this one this this uh, this uh, theorem really quickly using Ford circles. Okay, so uh, again, what are we doing in the talk? I, so I said I would tell you something classical, and then I would tell you uh, my thoughts on on how this could be generalized, and then I would tell you a little more details on how we're actually going to implement the generalization. So we were done with the classical story, and now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this thing can be generalized uh, to higher dimensions, right? And so my main point of curiosity from this thing was wondering what this, so I know that people study uh, packings, so I, I don't, this is my first, you know, venture into sphere packings, and I know that people study them, you know, uh, not really from like a, well, I mean, they study them uh, using initial clusters and, and expanding out. I mean, there's lots of ways that they, they study them, but I'm mostly interested in, in uh, the, what this has to do with Mobius transformations in the ring theory of, of this. Okay, so my goal is to describe, is to get to some of these drawings here where this is where some of the complications first appear. This is an H3 and, um, and here we, we replace PSL2Z with, with so-called like Bianchi groups, which are a very well-studied class of examples. Uh, after this, I'm gonna try and show you, um, uh, I'm gonna try and get to, uh, so this is a packing in hyperbolic three space, and I'm gonna try and get to a packing in hyperbolic four space, and then show you a picture or a movie of what such a packing would look like, okay? Um, so my goal is to get there. Okay, by the end of the talk to kind of describe what's going on. All right. Um, okay, so whenever you start a project, of course, you, um, uh, uh, you, you can, uh, you go through the literature. And so let me just say sphere packings are very old, right? Um, and uh, circle packing, so formulas for radiuses of, of, uh, of so if, if, if you have uh, mutually tangent uh, circles, right? you can produce a packing, right? And uh, given the curvatures of those initial circles, you can figure out the curvatures of the, the, all the circles that are generated in this way. And that, that was a theorem of, of Descartes, right? Um, in the literature, okay, so let me tell you something about sphere packing literature that I, that I discovered, is that everything is misattributed to, to like, it's like a pattern to misattribute all the theorems to people who really didn't do much on the theorem. So for, so, okay, so there's, the, there's these Sadi packings, which are, which are this packings in three dimensions and these Gasset packings in, 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 uh, is the generalization of this. And this, came, this was in a, in a Nature article in 1936. And they're actually just, if you go look at the paper when you're like, okay, it's supposed to appear here. They're actually just poems, right? About sphere packings, all right? So they don't really have, uh, my, there are no proofs, right? And um, it turns out that that these results appeared a lot earlier. I mean, and and uh, I think Jeff Legarius and Kantorovich and some people have tracked the literature down to the 1800s, and then beyond that, I don't know. You know, maybe they're earlier than that, but they at least come from 1886. You know, was you know, so they're way earlier than this. Also, Ford's name got attached to this whole story because. He wrote an article in the American Mathematical Monthly uh, in the 30s, and he he doesn't he's not the originator, you know, he's not he did not invent uh, Ford circles, right? I think these are, these things are kind of ancient. Um, all right, I mean, yeah, okay. So the other thing that you want to look up is, is um, what are fairy fractions in higher dimensions. So there, there's been some work by Catherine Stange in, in um, a, a Colorado Boulder, which, which attempts to uh, clarify, uh, or, or which, which uh, puts forth these things called Schmidt arrangements as an analog of uh, fairy fractions in higher dimensions. Um, and she proposes this because of the relationship between uh, uh, these Schmidt arrangements and uh, continued fractions. So one thing I didn't say is that, um, so you have a really good, excuse me. So for um, these fairy fractions, if I were just gonna stick a random rational number in there, 
you can you 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 there's a theorem that says that this thing is well approximated by this one over two q squared. You get a you get a good estimate, and you can get similar estimates for um it, for using these these uh these uh Schmidt arrangement things. So what's a Schmidt arrangement? So a Schmidt arrangement is uh okay. So this is all about uh uh things like PSL two z adjoin i, right? So here we replace PSL two z with PSL two z adjoin i. And then you take the real axis and then you look at the orbit of the real axis under these transformations. And so this is, so these are what are called super packings. So they're not, they, these circles don't have empty interiors, uh, so, so disjoint interiors, but they're, um, uh, so, but they're, uh, they, they're only tangent at a point. So they're, you're never going to get a crossing like, like this. Okay. So this is um, the Schmidt arrangement for, for Z adjoin I. Here, uh, so this is the same picture, but kind of colorized. These are on, on her web page. Uh, and then um, here is uh, Q adjoin the square root of minus 11, for example. So there's a bunch of different uh, things. These are kind of interesting. Um, okay, the, there's kind of a, a general uh, setup and classifications for these super packings that was given by uh, Kantorovich and Nakamura. And, um, uh, and I don't know, I, I'm not going to say that so much about this. This, so Stange works in uh, the boundary of hyperbolic three space uh, or, you know, or just the complex plane. Um, you can extend this to quaternionic numbers, right? And, uh, and, and this is a student of Kantorovich, uh, Shade Wasser, who, who worked on this sort of thing. And you can produce other super packings in higher dimensions as well. And I think beyond this dimension, the super packing stuff is not clear. Anyway, this was supposed to be our fairy fraction stuff. And it turns out that like, uh, it seems to be a little bit of a red herring for, um, for what we want to study actually. So our fairy fractions will end up being different. And I'm not gonna say much beyond that, that, that in the literature, there's these two things and, and one is, is supposed to be fairy fractions, but it turns out to be a little bit so the relationship between our packings and tangencies will be different. So, okay, so these are just kind of some crazy pictures. All right, so one thing that I said from the beginning is what I wanted to do was, was, was kind of replace the conformal maps or the Mobius transformations in the complex numbers with the Mobius transformations in, in, um, in the quaternions. And this is a classic, thing that people have been doing for a very long time is to try, is to generalize, um, you know, the conformal geometry of the complex numbers to other situations, okay? Um, as a reminder, the quaternions are, as a vector space, they're four dimensional over the reals and they're generated by I and J. And, and, we're I, and, and sometimes we call I times J, we call that K. And they're, well, I squared, J squared, and K squared, they're all equal to negative one. And I times J is equal to K. J times K is equal to I, and K times I is J. So there's this kind of cyclic relationship between these numbers, okay? So this is the uh, quaternions, Hamilton's quaternions. So these are called the Hamilton's quaternions. There's other quaternion algebras, which are not, which, which, um, which are, are algebras over another field, right? other fields. So like, for example, I could do the same constructions with Q, but those aren't the, 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 the quaternions that were originally considered. Um, this, this is a, a division algebra. So that means, so this is a very nice a ring. It's as close to a field as you can get, but it's not commutative. So every element which is non-zero has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so now I'm gonna just kind of run through some of the numerology uh, comparing uh, the complex numbers in the upper half space with the quaternions. Okay, so um, so in this situation, the the Mobius transformations take spheres to spheres or generalized spheres to spheres. This this is true in both of these situations. Okay, so that's kind of uh, that's one of the first things that I you, know, you notice about these things. Um, so the other thing is that you can you can take a half space and, and turn it into a ball. Uh, there's like a Cayley transformation for both of these these things. Uh, and there's actually Cayley transformations in in for general kind of 
for general Mobius groups, but those don't have to do with algebra. Those are, there's a, there's a, well, okay, there is a version with algebra, there's a version without algebra, and we'll get to that in a sec. Um, okay, but let's look at um, the automorphisms, okay, of, of these half spaces. Okay, so the automorphism of H2, as we described, this is PSL2R. Something that's well known is that the automorphisms of H3 are PSL2C, okay? And now you'll start to notice something weird, okay? The weird thing is, is that this is four dimensional, H is four dimensional as a real thing, but H3 is three dimensional. So the co-dimension drops, okay? So maybe this is not what we want to do, okay? The, we, the, the co-dimension doesn't really match. <coughs> All right, so um, all right, so let's let's see if we can get well, well. Maybe we we're not supposed to look at the automorphisms of hyperbolic three space, but if we want the co-dimensions to match, we want maybe the automorphisms of, of four space, and we we somehow stick four space into the quaternions. In 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 this case, like um, okay, so is this what we want to do? Right? Do we want to look at hyperbolic four space so that it's embedded, so we have a proper half space, and we can move it to a ball? like we, we want to, right? So half spaces are supposed to be balls and uh, that's, you know, and we want to do that. Okay, so it's supposed to be, P, is it PSL2 of things? So one thing that's well known is that um, PSL2 or the hyperbolic space, when you look up automorphism of a hyperbolic space, if you were to Google it, they would, uh, Google would, would tell you that there are Lorentz groups. So this is like SON1, right? Um, and, and, but that doesn't have a description in terms of a ring like I want, right? Um, so what could this question mark, question mark be? Okay, so, um, okay, so could it be R or could it be C? Those are the sub rings, right? I mean, this one's already used and we, we already saw that this was, um, uh, this is too small. That was the automorphisms of H2. And then we already saw that's automorphism of H3. So we've ran out of space, right? We don't have, uh, we can't do PSL2C. So we don't really have any subrings anymore. We ran out of subrings, okay? So we can't really do this, um, um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the way that we want. So we can't just take like K to be pure, you know, we would hope that like we can maybe take K, like we IJ and maybe you want, the K part to be positive and, and define our half space like this. Okay, so what are we gonna do about the situation? Like, it seems like everything just breaks in dimension once you try to go to higher dimensions, right? So um, not quite, right? So it turns out that this bad idea where I was saying hyperbolic three space, it seemed like hyperbolic three space just abandoned one of the dimensions of the quaternions, right? You just kind of like threw away one good dimension. This is actually the correct thing to do, right? And I, I claim that hyperbolic three space is naturally associated with the quaternions, which is a four dimensional thing. And I, let me allow me to explain, okay? So, uh, and this theory comes via Clifford algebras. Okay, so let me explain how this works. Okay, so this is a spoiler, and I'm going to spend the rest of the talk kind of explaining this um, this thing, in in kind of the dictionary about how how this works. So, so we can construct these things called Clifford numbers or the standard Clifford algebra, the real Clifford algebra, and inside the Clifford algebra, so these things, this these Clifford algebras, they're like two to the n dimensional as uh, real vector spaces, right? So as you increase n, they get bigger and bigger, right? They get exponentially bigger. But within this, the, the, the Clifford algebra, there's a certain vector space, a subspace, which are called the, the set of Clifford vectors, which is of dimension n. And these things uh, stay dimension n. And the interesting part about the Clifford algebras and Clifford vectors is that the Clifford algebra acts on the Clifford vectors in interesting ways. So it gives you a lot of interesting representations, okay? And we're gonna use the Clifford vectors, right, to cut out the hyperbolic space, okay? And not use the full quaternion algebra. 
Um, in there's a theorem of Wallen, right, from 1909 that gives you a kind of a uniform description of automorphisms of hyperbolic space of every dimension in terms of two by two matrices with entries in these Clifford algebras. So if it's HN, then it'll be one dimension lower. Okay, so this kind of covers my initial thought and I've kind of told you now how we're going to recover from what looked like a problem using Clifford algebra. I kind of give you a spoiler and that's something you weren't completely supposed to understand, but I just wanted to write it down so you saw it once. Now I'm gonna pass over it again and, and describe it in more detail. Okay, so, um, okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about hyperbolic spaces and Clifford algebras. Okay, um, again, I'm gonna do like a little literature review here. Where did this idea come up? Okay, so it turned out that this theorem was proved in 1901 or the first place in the literature I can find it is in 1901. And the, this is the theorem that I was saying that the automorphisms of, there's a uniformization. There, so the a uniformization is just like a description of hyperbolic end space in terms of, um, in terms of Clifford algebras. And in this description, I can define a, what's called the Clifford group. And then I can define the, the Clifford Mobius transformations. And then I have, I have a, a way to generalize what, what happens in, in uh, you know, for the complex numbers in all dimensions, okay? So there's kind of a, a, a way to do this all at once, okay? This paper was not cited according, this is according to Alfors until 1949 was the next citation by this, this by Moss, who is a number theorist who does automorphic forms, okay? So uh, this paper was highly cited uh, and, and uh, it was, so it's in German, I can't read it. Um, and it, it has something to do with uh, automorphic functions and the Dirichlet problems. And, uh, and then it, it's cited later in some other analytic number theory papers about Klusterman sums and um, in Eisenstein series, it, it, Eisenstein series for Bianchi groups, which is the hyperbolic three space thing. So that's like PSL2, the Gaussian integers version of PSL2Z. Okay, then again, uh, there is a kind of a big gap in the application of, uh, of this stuff. And, and Alfors wrote three papers in the 80s about, uh, so he, would, he had earlier been developing, uh, uh, studying Mobius transformations without reference to Clifford algebras. And there's like some lecture notes on this, but then uh, he, he, you know, is converted and you starts to use uh, uh, Clifford algebras. And so around the same time, I mean, even before, I, I think before this as well, uh, representation theorists started using Clifford algebras uh, for, you know, in, in their theory too, but this is not Clifford analysis. It's a little bit different. Okay. So, um, okay. So in, in I, you see more papers, more and more papers start to use this Clifford analysis stuff. Because it's a, it's I, I I claim that this is an extremely convenient computational tool, right? Um, for doing working with hyperbolic space. Um, okay, so there was a big gap here, and there was a big gap here. That's all I wanted to say about this. But um, after the, the the 1984 paper, according to Google Scholar, is cited like 95 times or something. So now it's out. Right. So um, these these uh, these new versions of the Mobius transformations. But for some reason, I didn't know about this for, you know, I did, I had no idea. I knew about other descriptions of automorphisms of the hyperbolic space, but I did not know that you could do this with Clifford algebras and write hyperbolic, you know, just do, do this simple thing. Two by two matrices with entries in, in a ring, right? Okay, so what's a Clifford algebra, right? So I've been hyping up Clifford algebras and now I need to tell you what a Clifford algebra is. So this is a Clifford algebra, okay? So it's, it's a quotient of a ring by an ideal, okay? And I just need to tell you what everything is, okay? So I'm gonna do this in kind of a, a general sense. So if I, if I just take a commutative ring R, I can define a Clifford algebra, okay? So, um, and, and so what, if I take a, a free R module in a quadratic form on the R module, so, um, uh, then I can define this thing. So TV, so this is the tensor algebra 
And so all you do is you just, you know, take all tensor powers of your, your, uh, your module, and then, um, <clears throat> and then you make a, 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 a ring out of this. So that's like when I multiply two vectors, I, you know, tensor them. Okay. And then I quotient by a relation. Okay. So what's the relation? So the relation is essentially that V squared should be minus Q of V, where Q of V is the quadratic form. Okay. That's it. That's all there is to it. So all you've done is kind of taken your, you've taken all your basis vectors of say a vector space, right? And then I made an algebra out of it, but the algebra rule says that V squared must be minus whatever the quadratic form spits out. So this is, you know, that that's, uh, you know, it's like the, the norm squared of the vector should be, you know, you, when you square it, it should agree with the norm, the norm squared. Okay. So, um, Okay, within the Clifford algebra, there are the Clifford vectors. Okay, so what are the Clifford vectors? So the Clifford vectors, so again, if, if V is an R module and it has a basis gamma one through gamma N, okay? So then the Clifford vectors are just the, the it's, a, it's a subgroup, it's not a ring, it's, you know, it's just a subgroup spanned by, they're, they're kind of like the, the the basic, uh, the basic vectors, right? So they're spanned by the one and, uh, and gamma one through gamma N, right? So I just take all those things and, and then, then I get something that's like N plus one dimensional, okay? So this is just a subgroup, right? It's not a, a ring or anything fancy. All right. So uh, here's the Clifford algebra. So now let's let's uh, I've I've kind of dumped this on you the the uh, the the abstract stuff. And if you don't like rings, you probably hate me now. Uh, but let's go back to some more concrete. Oh, okay. I need to do one more abstraction. Sorry. Okay. So um, uh, okay. So there's one uh, thing that that you can do. Is a special case that I want to consider is that when your quadratic form looks like this. Right, so this is what a quadratic forms look like, where the AIs are some coefficients. I'm going to use this symbol, right, to denote the, the the Clifford algebra associated to that. So if I have a field and I and I do this, this is a this is one of the Clifford algebras I want to consider. Okay. So um, okay, so often over over fields like Q, uh, I mean over fields like Q, these are central simple algebras, and so they're um, they're nice. Okay, so. Okay, so let's look at some examples. If I do one in R, right, what is this thing? So I just have one element and I have, uh, so I have gamma squared is equal to minus one in this relation. And this is just the complex numbers, right? Okay, if I were gonna do this, I have two of them, right? And this one here, so I have, I have gamma one and gamma two, but now gamma, gamma one times gamma two doesn't get killed, right? Right, this is the quaternions. Okay, so um, uh, so there's another way of saying this. These are also I'm using gammas because uh, this agrees with uh, the Dirac matrices. So there's another representation of these. So if people are into that that sort of thing. Okay, so um, yeah, so we have uh, uh, um, uh, so this is this is our, our presentation of the quaternions, and then. Um, uh, so, the, okay, so what are the Clifford vectors in each of these? So in the complex numbers under this Clifford algebra guys, the Clifford vectors, well, it's just the whole thing. All, all the elements are Clifford, are, are Clifford vectors. But in the quaternions, right, it cuts out a three-dimensional thing because I took a quadratic form with, with two, uh, on a two-dimensional thing. And so I now have like the constant entry and then those two things, and that gives me the three dimensions. There, there, that explains why we we have this weird missing uh, uh, dimension in, in, in how to associate hyperbolic uh, three space with um, uh, to the quaternions, right? Which is a four dimensional thing, in a, in a very natural way. Okay, so we're going to be cutting things out using those that that version of the Clifford vectors. One thing I want to point out real quick for people who are familiar with quaternion algebras is that this notation that I just introduced for, for Clifford algebras 
generalizes the usual notation for quaternions, right? So uh, these are uh, strictly a generalization of, of quaternion algebras over another field, okay? So these are not the Hamilton's quaternions, but general quaternions where you specify that like something, you take two generators and something squared needs to be equal to A and something squared needs to be equal to B. Right? And so this is, uh, this is how you get that. Okay, so, um, all right, so, uh, now I'm going to give a name to these special Clifford algebras. So these are the ones that are going to generalize the reals, complexes, and um, in the quaternions and beyond, right? So I just take, I do that one, one, one thing, and I just take the Clifford algebra associated to that. And so this is, you know, we'll call this the nth real Clifford algebra or something, right? Um, uh, okay, so now uh, in this description here, uh, we have that C1 is the real numbers, C2 is the complex numbers, C3 is the quaternions, and C4, okay, that actually should not be 16 dimensional. It should be going up by dimension two every time. That should be eight dimensional, right? And I wanted to say that this is not the octonians. This is an associative, uh, this, is, this is associative, right? And not only that, this construction, you can, you can, uh, uh, bring it out to a higher ar arbitrarily, you know, it, it can get arbitrarily large. Okay, so this goes into every dimension. It doesn't just stop at the octonians. Okay, so the octonians are like a whole different story that needs to be, that, that, that should be developed on it, that is deserving of developing, you know, it should be studied on its own, um, uh, but it doesn't fit into this picture. Okay, all right. So one thing to remember is that the Clifford vectors for CN, okay, the way they've been indexed, and this is Alfors's notation, those are dimension N, okay? And if you just remember that that's of dimension N, okay, and, um, and you remember that, that VN is a subset of CN, then those, are the, those two things fix the, everything, okay? So like, if you can't keep track of the indices, right, just remember that the Clifford vectors are supposed to be dimension end, with the subscript n, they need to be n-dimensional. And then if you remember that the Clifford vectors are a subset of the associated Clifford algebra, the, the real Clifford algebra, the one generalizing the real complexes and quaternions, then this fixes everything, okay? So this is something, a quick check if you're kind of like lost in the indexing, okay? So, so okay, so let me just kind of repeat where we are, okay? So this is where I started with the spoiler, okay? The spoiler was, I'm gonna use Clifford vectors to uniformize hyperbolic space. And there's a theorem that says, automorphisms of hyperbolic space correspond to um, these Mobius transformations that associated to this Clifford algebra, okay? I'm not gonna give a description of the group, uh, but it's, it's relatively simple. Um, okay, so, so in this situation, in the classic situation, we have hyperbolic space is in V2, which is uh, in C2, which is just C. I guess and maybe that's an equality is the middle one as well. And we have that this one is, is the automorphism of H2 is, is, is one dimension lower, right? Which is PSL2R, okay? And um, here, uh, so now we can we can go to the quaternion case where we have H3, which is a subset of V3, and V3 is now is a proper subset of, of C3. So now they, they're not equal. And the automorphisms of H3 are PSL2C, okay? That's because you, you bump one down, okay? And you can keep going. Now in H4, right, it's contained in, in a V4, which is a four-dimensional vector space, and that's contained in C4. This is now... Uh, so this was four. This is eight dimensional, and um, and and you have some PSL two H. So fair warning that the, some people have some their version of PSL two H, and uh, this might not agree with that. But this is I claim this is the correct way to define PSL two H. Okay, um, okay. So this is a nice way and we can just keep going and have a description like this, okay? And so how am I going to get the arithmetic out of this, okay? So, okay, so we had the boundary of it, the hyperbolic space and that had to contain the rational numbers, okay? 
So now I'm going to take the rational version of the Clifford algebra, right? Um, uh, okay, sorry. There's there's a there's a typo here. That should be the Clifford. So okay. So I, I called that BN minus one, but th th that thing should actually be um, the, uh, it, it should be the Clifford vectors of uh, that, that algebra that I wrote down in red on the right-hand side, not just the algebra itself, okay? Um, all right, and so then how am I gonna get a discrete subgroup? Well, I take that rational Clifford algebra, okay? And then I'm gonna look at a maximal order in that algebra. All right, so I'm gonna look at, uh, you know, and so it turns out maximal orders are not unique in, in the non-commutative setting. And, um, uh, and so you have, to, you have to deal with, I mean, it's not such a big deal, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, but we, we, can, we can take orders in this thing now and, um, uh, uh, and, and we can proceed uh, with this group acting on hyperbolic space. And it turns out that, you know, that the, one of the interesting parts is that these Mobius transformations, they fix the Clifford vectors. So that's like, uh, it, I mean, the whole thing is set up to do this. Okay, so here's my first picture, right? Of, I, I was trying to draw these in, uh, uh, in, in, in higher dimensions, okay? And, um, uh, and, and so uh, this was during the pandemic and uh, that's my son. So we, we were, were doing some uh, chalk drawings of, uh, uh, that's my collaborator uh, for, for this project. Uh, and it's kind of a crappy drawing, okay? But, so then I, I decided to get out Sage because I'm not very good at drawing these. And so this is what this one looks like for QGI. These are the normal spheres for, for in, this, in this situation, okay? So this is, what it this is what this packing looks like. So this is, uh, I guess this is flipped upside down. The bottom, the, the top thing there is, um, uh, is really the, the, the boundary of hyperbolic space. And so this one here, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, if I were to flip it the other way around, the right way up, you wouldn't see anything. So I had to, I had to put it this way. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe I should have flipped that upside down. Anyway, okay. So uh, then, I, I, then I did a couple more of these. So, um, so you can see that the, these two are interesting. Um, so there's something to be said about the, the, this, Q adjoint square root of minus five. So some number theorists will notice that Q adjoint square root of minus five, that's the only one on this page that's class number not equal to one, right? So this is the non-UFD case. And you'll notice that these, these are kind of detached, right? So there's something about the orbits of, of um, so the, the orbits under these group uh, of the rationals under the, uh, uh, the orbit of infinity under uh, PSL2 of this order of the, this Bianchi group. Uh, so there'll be multiple orbits when uh, it's not a UFD. And so uh, this is sort of responsible for this disconnected phenomenon. Okay, so here, here are pictures. So now I'm getting you ready for the four dimensional picture. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken these hyperbolic three space pictures and I've just smashed them, okay? and then draw, draw, drawn only the boundary, okay? Because, and you'll notice that there's some overlapping here, but this is all I can draw once I go to four dimensional space. I can only embed things in three dimensions and those three dimensional images, those three dimensional spheres that I'm gonna show you are the smooshed versions of the four dimensional things that is on the next slide, okay? So um, that's what, what's coming up, um, okay? so. Uh, all right, and so here are the normal spheres for um, for this thing. And so there was a little problem with Sage with um, the normalization here, which is kind of annoying because um, some of them look like they're not moving very much. Uh, but um, so what's happening here is I'm taking, so just like we did for the fairy fractions, right? We started at a certain level, right? And then you can you can go, as you go up, you'll get, um, uh, you know, you'll get a finite number of spheres. You get, you get a certain number of spheres at a certain level, okay? And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking the spheres of one level and then I'm taking the adjacent level 
And then I'm plot, so I take one level, I plot them. Then I take the adjacent level and I plot them together. And then I remove this level. And then I take the next level down and I plot them, right? And then I remove this level. And then I take the next level down and I plot them and I remove this. And that's this picture that we're seeing here. So uh, that's how we can see this. That's it.